Welcome everybody to Spokane City Council legislative session for Monday, November 27th. I'll rise for the pledge. To the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Ms. Sister, could you read the roll? Council President Kinnear. Present. Councilmember Bingle. Here. Councilmember Ulrich. Present. Councilmember Cathcart. Present. Councilmember Stratton. Here. Councilmember Wilkerson. Present. Councilmember Zapone. Here. Let the record reflect that all council members are present. Thank you. And we have a proclamation and a salutation. And the first one is Christmas Tree Elegance Week. And Jennifer, welcome. Please come up to the podium. I'm going to be reading it and presenting it. Thank you. Whereas the Spokane Symphony Associates is a nonprofit organization comprised of a diverse group of dedicated men and women who believe that having a symphony orchestra in Spokane enhances the quality of life in the community. And whereas the Spokane Symphony Associates exists to provide financial and volunteer support for the Spokane <coughs> Symphony Orchestra as well as educational and involvement opportunities for the community. And this symphony season will celebrate its 78th anniversary. And whereas one of the goals of the Spokane Symphony Associates is to provide an annual community family event, Christmas Tree Elegance, to herald the holiday season, which in its 41st year continues to be their largest fundraiser <clears throat> for the Spokane Symphony Orchestra. And they are grateful for the ongoing support this memorable event receives from the Spokane community. Now, therefore, Nadine Woodward, Mayor of the City of Spokane, on behalf of the citizens of Spokane, do hereby proclaim the weeks of November 28th through December 10th, 2023, as Christmas Tree Elegance Weeks in Spokane, and invite the citizens of and visitors to our grand city to join with me in this delightful celebration of the holiday season in support of the outstanding efforts of the Spokane Symphony Associates to support the Spokane Symphony Orchestra. Please Thank say a you. few words. Thank you very much. In room, Council President Kinnear, all the council members, and I want to thank the mayor's office too. We so appreciate your support every year. You all are wonderful. Um, you know, the symphony provides free concerts to the public, not just those concerts in the Fox, but the ones up at Comstock Park, and of course at the 4th of July in, in the pavilion. And um, it really, I can't imagine Spokane without a symphony orchestra. It's one of those markers that makes a city real grown up. And um, it's such an economic and cultural driver for this city. Christmas tree elegance starts the holiday season. I can't imagine the holiday season without that either. We have wonderful trees this year. They're both at the Davenport and at River Park Square. And as always, tickets to win a tree are only a dollar. It only takes one. So come down and um, try your chances and just celebrate Christmas with us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Right. So next up is uh, Councilmember Wilkerson. You have a few things to say. I have. A, I have a few things to say. Thank you, and I am very honored and humbled to be able to read this salutation this evening, saluting the public service of Council President Lori Kinnear. Whereas Lori Kinnear has represented the community members of Spokane since 2016, first as a representative of District Two, then as City Council President. And whereas she has devoted her time on council to effectively affecting change through a prolific amount of legislation, including spearheading the City of Spokane Community Garden Project, which empowers residents to grow and sell local produce, creating the ordinance that allows for the establishment of local historic districts, which has already been utilized by two neighborhoods and will continue to preserve Spokane's history for future generations creating an ordinance limiting noise disturbance around healthcare facilities, sponsoring legislation involving human trafficking prevention, including advocating for better resources in public spaces for those who are trafficked or abused, and working to help small businesses through initiatives to expand parklets and streeteries and legislation clamping down on delivery fees from third party platforms. Whereas in her time on council, as long because she's been here a while, whereas in her time on council, Lori has driven environmental protection policy, 
including sponsoring the passage of the Spokane's first sustainability action plan, passing two revisions to the urban forestry code, leading the effort to use goats in Spokane's urban wildlife interface for fire fuel mitigation, which was very entertaining and effective, passing a drought response plan, an ordinance reestablishing water use expectations, updating impact fees and GFCs, and leading the way on legislation that protects riparian zones. And whereas Kinnear is well known for building consist consensus and for her razor sharp wit, thank you, and whereas Kinnear has led the council steadfastly as the first woman to hold the position of city council president. Now, therefore I, Betsy Wilkerson, Spokane City Council member and council president elect on behalf of the community members of Spokane, hereby salute Lori Kinnear for her years of service to the city of Spokane. I, Betsy Wilkerson, Spokane City Council member elect, do hereunto set my hand and cause the seal of the city of Spokane to be affixed this 27th day of November 2023. So I forgot about all that stuff. Well, that's why I said it was long. Wow. <laughs> uh, so thank you, everybody. I am going to miss each and every one of you. You don't think I will. I'm going to miss you all because not only is it entertaining. I learn something every time I come into this space, hearing from you, learning from you, appreciating that you took your time to come down here because you're passionate about what you want to say and what you, what you believe. So I appreciate that. I appreciate every one of you. We don't always agree, and that's how it's supposed to be. We're not supposed to always agree. We're supposed to have dialogue that's um, pithy. I like that word. And dialogue that makes us think about what we're doing for our community and if we're doing the right thing. And each and every one of you I've learned from and I appreciate you all. I'm gonna be down here in a couple weeks. I'm gonna sign up for open forum and I'm gonna just say what's on my mind. You're gonna be so sorry to see me, <laughs> but it'll be fun. It'll be fun. It'll, it'll be, be fun. fun. So goats. thank you all, appreciate you. Remember two minute limit. Yeah, two minute limit. <laughs> yeah. got it. And speaking of open forum, we are going to transition to open forum. And I'm going to call three names at a time if you want to come down, save us a little time. Uh, and you all know the rules. Mutual respect. That's all I have to say. Mutual respect. You have two minutes. Jacoby's keeping track. Yes, there we go. And first three, Hannah Nelson. Sure, we don't clap now. We clapped because we were joyous at all these uh, proclamations and salutations, but there is no clapping during any of the testimony. So just be aware of that. And again, it's about mutual respect. Treat us as you would want to be treated and vice versa. So we have Hannah Nelson. I think it's Zane, Z-A-Y-N, Alexander, and John Hancock. Do you want to come down? Hannah, you're first. We have two minutes. All right, good evening. My name is Hannah Nelson, and I live in the West Central neighborhood. I would first like to echo the words that countless people have brought night after Monday night, condemning resolution 2023-0091 that was passed by this council on October 9th. The reasons for that have already been covered more eloquently than I could hope to, and I'm sure they're going to be covered again tonight. Um, what brings me back tonight is what I witnessed at last Monday's City Council meeting. I saw members of certain groups, specifically those opposing that resolution, <clears throat> being targeted by extra stringent enforcement of the rules. I went back and listened to that very long meeting um, to make sure I remembered correctly. So as public forum began, the rules, including those about not clapping, were not read out. A handful of people were clapping after statements, and fewer did so as each time Council President reacted and said to stop, without always clarifying what needed to stop. After a couple of warnings, it was quickly escalated to threats of recessing the meeting and bringing in security, which is no light threat given all of the visible law enforcement in the chamber and behind chambers. 
Meanwhile, people who spoke on other topics naturally also broke rules, but were not held to the same incredibly high standard of behavior. Given the intimidating presence of law enforcement and being told that clapping one more time would essentially shut the meeting down, my heart dropped when the groups that I was with broke out in applause at an outcome we'd hoped for. However, we were told, quote, okay, you can clap, it's good. We were given the benefit of the doubt, whereas immediately the worst was assumed of those speaking on the resolution. This is concerning, together with the previous reading of council rules that hadn't allowed members to be named and held accountable, that's not the environment that citizens should be faced with when they want to engage with local politics. Um, free Palestine, I see my time. Thank you. Thank you. Zane, I, I'm not sure if I pronounced it correctly. Zane. Okay, wanna come up? And Zane is online. Oh, all right. Zane, go ahead, you're unmuted. Um, I'm here to demand justice for displaced Palestinians around the world and the Palestinians who have suffered under Israel's violent tyranny for decades. In the legislative meeting on October 9th, a councilman introduced Resolution 91, a statement affirming Israel's, quote, right to exist and, quote, right to self-defense that was put forth without comment or opinion from the people you claim to represent. When putting the resolution together, the councilman admitted to, quote, copy and pasting full, full statements from the council's previous resolution on Russia and Ukraine. The gross misstep in comparing Russia and Ukraine to what's happening in Palestine is perhaps a conversation for another day. But in his haste to plagiarize, the councilman neglected to confer with the Palestinians and Muslims of Spokane. The result is a one-sided piece of legislation that encourages ethnic cleansing and ignores the last 75 years of Israel's war crimes. Following Israel's month of atrocities, I urge you all to revise Resolution 91. Your lives may not be affected by the major spike in anti-Palestinian racism, but trust us when we say that our lives are horribly impacted by your words and actions. I refuse to stand by and watch you people push rhetoric that makes white men feel emboldened to shoot my brothers in Vermont, to stab my sisters and six-year-old nephews to death in Houston and Chicago. Council members, you seem unaffected by the stories and videos and pictures of dead Palestinian babies and the shell-shocked toddlers. Palestinian mothers hold humble birthday parties for their children, only to be slaughtered by Israel the next morning. Is this the self-defense you speak of? It's no secret that APAC Zionists donate huge amounts of money to US politicians at every level. So I guess I have to ask, how much money would buy your compassion? Once again, I urge you to revise Resolution 91 or else let Spokane go down in history as a city that watched Israel relentlessly murder 15,000 innocent people in the span of one month and enthusiastically support it. Thank you. Thank you. John Hancock, Mickey Hatfield, and then Doug. John Hancock is my name, representing the West Plains Water Coalition. The current twin plumes of PFAS from firefighting foam affects thousands of West Plains residents, including many within the city of Spokane. The extent is still being measured, but the facts are inevitable. Public records requirements in Washington and FOIA at the Pentagon mean that secrecy is just about over. There are no industrial emitters that we know of. Contaminated groundwater runs downhill from two airports towards the Spokane River, 400 to 500 feet below. It's not a tremendous amount of water, but when the EPA drops the safe level from 70 parts per trillion to four, the safety standards for the river will change abruptly. You know all about that with PCB. Ecology's airport investigation and EPA's Fairchild Superfund methods can work together towards a unified community solution if we say so hard enough. Why should this matter to the city of Spokane? It's groundwater contamination headed downhill towards the Spokane River. You all have your own experience with local governments bickering and competing. PFAS is a new topic on which to build commonality and joint strategy. The West Plains Water Coalition seeks City of Spokane engagement in four specific ways. One, untangle the joint city and county oversight of the airport, what went wrong. Number two, engage with Ecology's airport investigation and cleanup plan. Number three, push for transparency in the Fairchild cleanup and number four, tie the growth management plan protections to groundwater stewardship and PFAS investigation. Count us in on collaborative and fast moving efforts towards big accomplishments. Thank you. Thank you. Mickey, Doug, and then Terry Hill. For decades, Israel forces have continually bullied, displaced, and humiliated Palestinians at every opportunity. 
Nobody really approves of the death and destruction that occurred on October 7th, but it's important to recognize that the decades of torment along with Israel's own support of Hamas, which Israeli officials have openly admitted to in the beginning, is how an honest participation in the peace process between Palestine and Israel was undermined. The destruction caused on October 7th does not give Israel the right to continuously and indiscriminately murder Palestinians with no regard for who dies, even including Israel's own people being held hostage in Gaza. Your resolution on October 9th says quite the opposite and is an abhorrent, abhorrent example of the depths of depravity this country's leaders and government's officials are willing to stoop to in order to prop up their influence in the Middle East via Israel. Supporting anything other than a permanent ceasefire and an end to the apartheid state of, in, in, in Israel displays a complete disregard for human life by this council. If you don't have enough of a heart to get that kind of humanity, then perhaps you don't have the right to be in control of any aspect of it. Retract your October 9th resolution immediately and show us if you have any kind of soul left with a new humanitarian resolution. And a brief word on the budget. I think it's vital that you direct funds to help the unhoused directly rather than give, giving money to the thugs in blue to punish them for causing problems that you create in the first place by not giving them the help they need with that money. Thank you. Thank you. And Doug, then Terry Hill, and Russell Webster. Who was that? Doug? Doug Hawken? Here we go. I'm Doug Hawken, and I live in Liberty Lake. Um, we demand that the Spokane City Council retracts the October 9th resolution and passes a new resolution in its place, which includes the following. Demands an end to all U.S. military and foreign aid to the state of Israel. Our tax dollars are funding genocide, occupation, and ethnic cleansing against the Palestinian people. Since October 7th, over 20,000 Palestinians have been killed in Gaza by Israel, including more than 8,000 children. Thousands more are trapped under the rubble. The Israel siege of Gaza blocks access to safe drinking water, food, electricity, and fuel, which threatens the lives of 2.3 million people, including countless newborn babies in neonatal facilities that are at risk of losing power and shutting down. 1.7 million Palestinians in Gaza have been forced from their homes by Israel, as half of the homes in Gaza have been destroyed by Israel using rockets and bombs provided by the United States. This is ethnic cleansing. In the occupied West Bank, Israel settlers have killed hundreds of Palestinians and thousands have been arrested. Over 10,000 Palestinians, including hundreds of children, are being held as political prisoners by Israel. All Palestinian political prisoners must be freed. We urge the city council to re retract the original resolution and modify it. Thank you. Terry Hill, Russell Webster, and then Kadeem Rama. Terry Hill, longtime Spokane resident. Pro taxpayer projects, taxpayer funded projects that appear to be extravagant and benefit and provide few benefits to the public and even better benefits to a select few, are often referred to as boondoggles. Two of Spokane's best known boondoggles would be the Riverfront, parking, Riverfront Park parking garage and the STA Plaza with its $20 million construction costs, a $2 million remodel, and million dollar a year operating budget. In 2020, our now outgoing mayor appeared to say hold my beer 
when she signed a 10-year, $13,000 a month lease on a posh former bank building downtown and proceeded to spend $300,000 of taxpayer money to retrofit that building. What goes on inside that building is somewhat a bit, bit of a mystery. The building's often dark. There's no access to the general public. If you look through any, any of the storefront windows, they're dark. You can't see anything. Well, I did manage to look through one of them tonight on my way over here. There were some empty boxes and some uh, uh, unused office equipment there. $13,000 a month. The justification for this building was to deter crime in the downtown core. Three years into that 10-year lease, how's that working out, Spokane? Why don't you ask many of the victims of the assaults, robberies, stabbings, and shootings that occur within blocks of that building? Ask a downtown partnership, the downtown business cartel, that's hiring, hiring private, private security to make their customers feel safe. I have a longer list, but pressing time, I yield the podium. Thank you. Uh, Russell, Webster, Codine, and then Ashley. Greetings, my name is Russell Webster. I'm a resident of Spokane. Because we cannot seem to speak of Palestinian life in this society as worthy of our compassion and no less deserving of the rights and freedoms we enjoy, I must resort to speaking of ourselves and one of our own representative bodies and their insults to not only our own perceived freedoms, but to those whom we exterminate supposedly to secure said freedoms. It's the same tale told twice in the United States and Israel. It's the same harmful lie told in the resolution this council passed on October 9, 2023, one day after Israel launched its revenge, which it calls war or mowing the grass. The council person who sponsored the proposal resolution said, this afternoon I'll bring a forward a resolution supporting Israel's right to exist and condemning the acts of war perpetuated by Hamas and its allies. It is quite telling that the council member invokes Israel's so-called right to exist, as though any state has an inherent right to exist. And it says a great deal when a people who are globally recognized as occupied by the state of Israel, who have a right to liberation, are accused of committing an act of war when in fact Israel and the West started the so-called war long ago. Urging war and violence using the rhetoric of Hamas and their allies just two days after October 7th is criminally irresponsible. Look at how quickly the war spread while the nationalist mob made hawkish accusations from their armchairs in the heart of the West Empire, only emboldening the Biden-Netanyahu war machine. Rescind the resolution. Free Palestine. Thank you. And... Kadeen, Ashley, and Warbear. Hello, my name is Kadeen Rahman. I'm a Muslim, and I'm a member of the Party for Socialism and Liberation. I'm here tonight to speak once again on this council's resolution on the genocide in Palestine. I stood here weeks ago to point out how this resolution was racist, colonial, ahistorical, and regurgitated Zionist narratives that have been used to justify Israel's ongoing ethnic cleansing against the Palestinian people. I was not alone when I called for this council to rescind its resolution and instead assert the Palestinian people's right to liberation, to call for the end of the U.S. aid to Israel, and to condemn the genocide in Gaza. But instead of taking accountability for their sponsorship of genocide, this council decided to silence my comrades and attempt, the comrades attempt to call them out. This forum is meant for this council to hear directly from the people of Spokane. Yet if those people disagree with the council's actions, they move to silence them. This was very clear when the council fled their chambers at the mention of certain council members' names. Uh, I'm talking directly to you, council president, when I say that there was council member Bingle that proposed this racist resolution in which it was stated, and I quote, this resolution is condemning the violent act of war perpetuated against the state of Israel and affirming its right to exist and defend itself, end quote. This quote continues on by saying, 
And whereas each of us have a personal responsibility to prevent the spread of misinformation and condemn violent acts in any form. This statement is peak hypocrisy as council member Bingo did not once attempt to condemn the state of Israel for its constant massacre of the Palestinian people. Bingo didn't even attempt to consult Palestinians in Spokane on their thoughts about this resolution before presenting it to the rest of this council for every single one of you to vote in support of genocide. So instead of this council actually hearing from its constituents, they were too busy silencing my comrades David and Zach's attempt to directly call them out on their hypocrisy. There are clear examples of this in the past as well. And once again, I'm addressing you, Council President, when I say that Bingo called a point of order on my camera, David, for not only directly addressing him, but also simply stating the fact that the state of Israel is an apartheid state. Bingo stated, and I quote, my point of order is outside of just naming the council members, we also have a rule of decorum and respect. To continue to label the country apartheid is incredibly disrespectful and is outside of bounds. He says this while on September 25th, people spoke of their appreciation of council member Bingo, naming him without being interrupted. So time why is was up. this allowed? Time is up. Thank you. We know why. Because this council stands on the side of genocide, apartheid, Ashley. and misery, and not on the side of liberation, self-determination. Point democracy. of order. Ashley, Warbear, and Natalia. We demand that the Spokane City Council retracts the October 9 resolution and passes a new resolution in its place which does the following. Demands an end to an all U.S. military and foreign aid to the state of Israel. Our tax dollars are funding genocide, occupation, and ethnic cleansing against the Palestinian people. Since October 7th, over 20,000 Palestinians have been killed in Gaza by Israel, including more than 8,000 children. The Israeli siege of Gaza blocks access to safe drinking water, food, electricity, fuel, which threatens the lives of 2.3 million people, including countless newborn babies in neonatal facilities, which are at risk of losing power and shutting down. All Palestinian people deserve human rights. Condemn the state of Israel's war crimes and crimes against humanity, especially the deliberate targeting of civilians, women, children, journalists, and medics. Israel has a long history of international in intentional violence against civilians and other protected classes. Violence that dates back to the first Zionist settlers during the British mandate for Palestine and continues into the present day. All Palestinian people deserve human rights. Provide a critical historical context to help the people of Spokane community understand the root cause of the current crisis. The October 9 resolution portrays the conflict as something that started on October 7th as if out of thin air. The framing erases 75 years of violence, suffering, and humiliation experienced by Palestinians under the settler colonial regime of Israel. Palestinians under, Palestinian people under this regime have been living in a constant state of terror, trauma, and oppression. All Palestinian people deserve human rights. We demand a new resolution that humanizes the Palestinian resistance, gives voice to their righteous liberation struggle, and calls for an end to U.S. military aid to the state of Israel. Free Palestine. Warbear, Natalia, and Brooke, give me. Yoho, Papuya mi mana a homa, ir shopi, do a tadino wamo, who truly da shushri wamo, nashri a wamo. My Lakota name is Laughing Eyes, my Pueblo name is Papuya me, the name that I had blessed in ceremony and prayer and sweat is Warbear, this name that I've earned. I call an eyes, English name is Daniel. We're on the homelands of the Spokane, the Spokane people, with culture exchange from the Nimipu, the Nez Perce, the Kalispelia, Kalispel, the Bikani, Blackfeet, Blackfoot. This is indigenous land. My people are ancient. Being Pueblo, Lakota, and European, I'm mixed, and I grew up most of my life colonized, and I've had to do years and years of work to decolonize, and I'm a living testament to the decolonization process, and I'm a living testament to indigenous resilience and strength. If we're going to continue and be real about indigenous sovereignty and liberation and our rights, human rights as human beings, that includes Palestine, that includes aboriginals in Australia, that includes our people, North and South America, Turtle Island, it needs to be global. My people have survived the onslaught of genocide for over 500 years, and it continues. Native American wars have never ended. It's just changed form. 
What's going, on, what's going on over there in Palestine is a disgrace. Every time I open up my phone, every time I open up Instagram, I see dead kids. I see dead babies. I see dead children. I see women and children, the vulnerable, the innocent, suffering. I see murder, mutilation, rape, and I see genocide, period. And we're funding it, period. All the money that you spend, the United States war machine, the corporations, government, Black, Black Friday, all of it. We're spending it and it's going towards that. Period. I'm indigenous. My existence is resistance. And we need to stop this. We need to stop this senseless killing. Free Palestine. Thank you. Natalia, Brooke, Kidney, Andrew, Cowie. Hello, City Council. I am here to ask you to vocalize your support for a permanent ceasefire in Gaza and the West Bank and to rescind your October 9th resolution that unequivocally supported Israel. The number of Palestinians killed since October 7th has well surpassed 15,000, low estimate, and that is more than twice the number of students who currently attend Gonzaga University. As I've attended these meetings, I've heard people whisper disparagingly in the background, asking us why we're focusing on an issue oceans away. But the violence in Palestine is not oceans away, it's closer to home than you think. The victims of this violence are in our city, in this crowd, in this room, all affected by what they've seen their people go through. All oppression is interlinked. All of them feel the silence of the council. Over the past 40 something days, I have seen videos of entire neighborhoods in Gaza razed to the ground. I have seen countless Palestinians trapped in rubble as their communities dig them out with their bare hands. I have seen more dead bodies, more blood than I ever thought possible. Do Palestinians not deserve to live free of terror, to see their friends and loved ones for their holidays as we do? to love and be loved without bombs raining, bombs raining down on them. Communities across the globe are calling for an end to the violence and occupation Palestinians are facing, and we need more voices to join that chorus. Where do you want to stand when the dust settles? I want to leave you with this quote from a Gazan reporter who said this in distress after he found out that a colleague of his died despite the press supposedly being protected in war. He said, we can't take it anymore. We are exhausted, we are victims. The only difference between us is the time of death. Thank you. Thank you. Brooke, Kidney, Andrew, Cowley, Amanda, I don't know what your last name is. Good evening, everyone. My name is Brooke, and I'm here to speak on the pro Israel resolution that was passed last month. I am asking that this be retracted. First, I want to say that I am an American patriot. Our politicians should work to benefit the American people. I'm kind of confused because it feels as if our American politicians pledge allegiance to Israel, not to us. They're eager to defend the borders of an apartheid state, but won't defend our own borders. We send billions of taxpayer dollars to the Zionists while our own cities are poor and unsafe. We should be focusing on issues like the fentanyl crisis, the border crisis, the housing crisis, etc., not Israel. Israel is not a good ally. They drain us of our taxpayer dollars and damage our reputation in the Middle East. Instead, we get statements from city council defending Israel. But I think that any American patriot who understands the conflict would side with the Palestinians because they are fighting to obtain the same human rights that we ourselves cherish so dearly, right? We believe that all men are created equal with the right to life, to liberty, and to the pursuit of happiness. Apartheid is the opposite of that belief. I have been watching in horror about what is happening in Gaza. How can it be that we are watching a genocide from our cell phones? Thousands of children have been slaughtered, buried in rubble. Thousands of civilians gone. Israel has deliberately targeted hospitals, schools, churches, mosques, and journalists. That is terrorism. Israel is a terrorist state. Please reverse the resolution. Thank you. Thank you. Andrew Cowley, Amanda, and then Ryan Olivia. Libera. Hi, I'm Andrew Cowley uh, from Spokane. I'm 
joining uh, my community here to demand that you withdraw your resolution of October 9th in support of the State of Israel. Uh, we would like to see a totally new resolution that will both endorse this community's demand for a ceasefire in Palestine and call for the withdrawal of every cent of American military aid. The United States government under every administration in all circumstances gives more money to apartheid Israel than to any other country. The citizens of Washington state pay tens of millions of dollars in federal taxes to the Zionist regime every year. And the genocidal killing of 20,000 Palestinians in just over a month would not have happened without the decades of unwavering military support to apartheid that this country has contributed and that the Biden administration continues. Were these millions spent at home on the needs of the people and not on the carceral system, all of our communities would feel the positive impact. City councils across the country in Providence, Rhode Island, in Easton, Pennsylvania, and Richmond, California, have made their own statements that condemn the war crimes of the IDF and express solidarity with the Palestinians. Your resolution expressed support for Israel's right to self-defense. Self-defense is the terminology the Israeli state uses for occupation, expulsion, kidnapping, carpet bombing, and the denial of food and medicine to millions of human beings for the crime of living in their home country. I'm asking that you please withdraw this offensive resolution and write one that gives voice to this community's desire and demand for justice at home and everywhere. From the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. Thank you. Thank you. Amanda, uh, Brian, Oliveira. Brian's online. Brian, you're online. Go ahead. Brian, you're unmuted. Go ahead. Sorry, Ryan, go ahead. This text is coming through. Oh, okay. Hold on. Let me troubleshoot the mic here. Hold on one second, Ryan. <clears throat> Can you try one more time, Ryan? Uh, we'll make it work. Go ahead. I'll put my mic by my computer. Thank you. I would like to demand a retraction of the October 9th resolution that fails to recognize the ongoing genocide against the Palestinian people by Israel. Over 20,000 Palestinians have been killed in Gaza by Israel since October 7th, with nearly half of them children and almost all of them non combatants Israel has also placed Gaza under siege blocking access to the basic utilities needed to support life. Their military has bombed essential facilities, including hospitals. All of this is occurring in a densely populated area containing over 2 million people, more people than there are in all of Manhattan. Similar atrocities have occurred in the West Bank, with hundreds killed and thousands arrested. In the recent past, Israeli snipers have explicitly targeted civilians, children, journalists, even medics during protests. These are war crimes and they have deep roots, dating back to at least the British mandate when the first settlers instigated violence against Palestinians, aided and abetted by the British Empire. Palestinians have existed under worsening colonialist oppression ever since. The people of Palestine have endured being violently evicted, brutality by the police and military, and other forms of indiscriminate killing by the British and later Israeli state. It is irresponsible to portray this conflict as something that began on the 7th of October. It is irresponsible to ignore the one-sided nature of this conflict, with the death toll that disproportionately impacts Palestinian civilians. The October 9th resolution does not take any of this into account, and it instead frames this as an ambiguous conflict that blames the Palestinians and does not hold Israel to account. This is not a religious conflict, but a colonial one. There must be a new resolution that treats Palestinians as humans, ones who are resisting colonialism, one that gives them a voice. We must call for an end to U.S. military aid to the apartheid state of Israel, and we need to be on the right side of history. Thank you. Thank you. Azalyn Croft. Assalamu alaikum, City Council. Um, 
a couple weeks ago, I said I would be back every week um, talking about this resolution, and, and I do mean that. Um, I want to speak from my heart. Um, I really, I really do think that um, the city council wants to do what's best for Spokane. I do believe that um, every single one of you wants to listen to your constituents and and do what um, needs to be done for our city. And so, um, so I do, I do have hope that you will retract the resolution on Israel and and write a new one and make it um, actually represent the diverse voices of of the city. Um, uh, yesterday, one of our um, elected officials, um, Kathy McMorris, uh, wrote an op-ed piece um, basically saying that um, any support for Palestine is a support for terrorism. And um, I, just, I just want to reiterate that there are people like me um, who are very visibly Muslim, um, who th that kind of rhetoric, that endangers us. Um, just walking to come to city council, people scream at me, throw things at me, um, curse, they say horrible things um, while I'm sitting in this room. And when I walk up and down the stairs, those people out there say the most horrific things to me every single week. And yet I come anyway because I am here for the liberation of all Palestinian people. And just remember, like one of, one of the speakers said before that, what we say, it isn't just a battle across the sea. Those are our kids. Those are our people. And there's people in Spokane that this affects every single day. Your words affect me. They affect my family. They affect my students. They affect my neighbors. They affect all of my brothers and sisters at my masjid. They affect every Arab, Muslim, Middle Eastern person. Please, please, please remember that your words affect us and, and we deserve to be safe. And I deserve to come to city council meetings and not have to be afraid coming here every week. Um, thank you. Thank you. Let's move to the consent agenda. The sister, do you want to read it? Sure. Reports, contracts, and claims. Number one, Ninth Amendment to the lease agreement between the Spokane Airport Board and City of Spokane for the Waste Energy Facility from May 1, 2023 through April 30, 2028, $264,600 annually, second to four five-year renewal options. Number two, consultant agreements with Integris Spokane for aid, design, and engineering services for upriver dam building interior remodel from November 1, 2023 through October 31, 2025, $140,250 plus tax if applicable. B, Water Department, Main Campus, Office Renovation, Reconstruction, Design, and Construction Management Services from November 1, 2023, through October 31, 2026, $908,011 plus tax if applicable. Number three, Consultant Agreement with Bureau Veritas, Technical Assessments, LLC, Owings Mills, Maryland, to provide facility system and structure condition assessments, including surveys and reports for the Northeast and West Central Community Centers from November 1, 2023 through October 31, 2024, $74,064 plus tax if applicable. Number four, Contract with Roar Works, LLC, for snow, uh, Spokane, Washington, for snow and ice removal for the intermodal facility the Public Defenders, Prosecutors Building, and City Hall, and for landscaping man maintenance at the Intermodal Facility and Public Defender Prosecutors Building. $135,595, excluding tax. Number five, contract amendment with Spokane Neighborhood Action Partners, utilizing community development block grant funds, extending funding through June 30, 2024, for A, Essential Home Repair Program, additional $290,000, total award amount $790,000. B, single family rehabilitation program, additional $590,445, total award amount, $2,075,324. Number six, approval of the Community Housing and Human Services Board's allocation recommendation and approval to allow Community Housing and Human Services Department to enter into template loan agreements with subrecipients as follows. A, St. John's 2 West 9th Senior Housing Project, $2,015,000. B, Volunteers of America, Eastern Washington and Northern Idaho, Vets on North L Lacey Project, $1,500,000. Item number seven, report of the mayor of pending claims and payments of previously approved obligations, including those of Parks and Library, through November 17, 2023, total $11,384,130.33 with Parks and Library claims approved by the respective boards. Warrants excluding Parks and Library, total $11,144,652.01. Thank you. We have one person signed up. That's Eric Lowe. You have three minutes. Okay. Good evening.
Good evening. My name is Eric Lowe, and I'm a stay-at-home dad residing in Spokane Valley. <coughs> <clears throat> I'm here to speak in favor of the snow removal contract or the contract for snow removal at City Hall. I think anyone who has spent a winter in Spokane recognizes how miserable it is to walk outside when sidewalks and pathways aren't cleared of snow. <coughs> I understand there's cost efficiencies for the city in contracting such activity out, but I would argue the social and economic benefits of unionized city jobs outweighs the minuscule savings the city gets from such contracts. That's why, in addition to the billion dollars in capital improvements I propose in Spokane Reimagined, I also allocate $500 million to projected operating costs over the first 10 years. The people-powered highways, as I've designed them, would entail over 140 miles of car-free and car-light streets, accessible to all ages and abilities year-round. With free pedal bike share and subsidized e-bike share, we wouldn't have to trip over another Lime scooter ever again. I'm proposing dozens of new pavilions, fountains, and over 40 new public restroom facilities. This is a lot of area to cover, which is also why they would need to have their own landscaping, snow removal, and cleaning crews. These crews also have the potential to serve as eyes on the street, deterring crime just by their presence. I don't know about your neighborhood, but on my block, only about half of the houses shovel the sidewalk after it snows. Everyone deserves to get to the grocery store safely. And with how some people drive in the winter, the safest means might be to forego vehicles altogether. Investing in city beautification, along with pedestrianization, will pay dividends as private investment pours in through new commercial districts, home equity increases, and residential development. People-powered highways would allow everyone the flexibility to travel safely anywhere in the city 365 days a year. These 140 miles of streets would have their own maintenance budget, freeing up current streets funds to be focused elsewhere in the city. Yes, I'm proposing to raise $2 billion through a new transportation and parks levy, but that money is a direct investment back into the community. New parks facilities citywide. A 24-7, 365 days a year tram along First Avenue from Brown's Edition to the Amtrak station, fully replacing or renovating all existing parks facilities. Hundreds of new, good-paying, unionized city jobs. That's in addition to all the private construction jobs $1 billion in new public facilities would create. Once again, I'm in favor of the snow removal contract as I don't want anyone breaking a hip on city property. But I think we could do much better by reinvesting in our city and using organized labor. Thank you. Thank you. Council commentary. Could I have a motion to accept the consent agenda? So moved. Second. Great. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Be opposed? Great. So, Ms. Fister, we're on to special budget ordinances. Ordinance C-36-466, amending ordinance number C-36-345, passed by the City Council December 12, 2022, and entitled an ordinance adopting the annual budget of the City of Spokane for 2023, making appropriations to various funds of the City of Spokane government for the fiscal year ending December 31, 2023, and providing it shall take effect immediately upon passage and declared an emergency and appropriating funds in. Asset Management Fund, number one, decreased appropriation by $21,200. A of the decreased appropriation, $21,200, is removed from base wages. Number two, increased appropriation by $21,200. A of the increased appropriation, $21,200, is provided solely for building repair and maintenance on behalf of Municipal Court. This action arises from the need to perform facility and technical improvements at Municipal Court. Thank you. We have two people signed up. Eric Lowe. Hello, my name is Eric Lowe, and I'm a stay-at-home dad residing in Spokane Valley. I'm here to speak in support of the reappropriation of $21,200 for repairs at the municipal court. Many public facilities within Spokane have lengthy lists of deferred maintenance, with this $21,000 being at the low end of such costs. That is why my proposal for Spokane Reimagined includes a $500 million budget boost for the Parks Department, which would allow them to replace or renovate every aging facility in their portfolio and provide the city significant financial leverage in getting out of its current budget hole. Additionally, Spokane Reimagined also includes an average of $35 million annually devoted to maintenance, cleaning, and stone, snow removal for the people-powered highways, a 140-mile grid of car-free and car-light streets connecting every neighborhood in the city uh, and allowing you to travel without a car. 
My goal, and what I think has the best chance of a success, is to get a $2 billion parks and transportation levy on the fall 2024 ballot. If you continue to ignore my, no my calls to delay the parks levy to November, it will not be difficult at all for me to transition to a move ahead Spokane transportation levy. That is what's most pressing, and that is what my pr primary focus has always been. Truthfully, it's cleaner and provides a significantly easier marketing push for voters. Spokane will just forego. Point of order, Council President. Is yes. this still on topic? Yes, it's okay. Okay. Uh, Spokane will just forego an additional three quarters of a billion dollars in new parks funding and facilities. Things like covered skate parks and basketball complexes, an indoor outdoor racket sports facility, the, North, the Pacific Northwest Premier Amphitheater, and a world class history museum. But it will be pretty easy for me to market the need for a complete overhaul of our transportation infrastructure. You've seen the pictures. Did you read the follow-up story to the family on Wellesley, Les Wellesley that I sent you on Wednesday? Don't worry, I printed out a copy for you there. Uh, but to summarize, a woman and her three disabled children are now homeless due to an SUV driving through the house they've rented for a decade. The landlord made her remove her belongings despite the fire department insisting. Point of order, Council yes. President. Yes. I, I don't see how this is on yeah, topic. He, he's, he's drifting now. Want to get it back on topic to this specific special budget ordinance? Uh, yeah. You have allowed Spokane to become a drag strip. You seemingly do not care. Spokane needs to do something. I will point to your continued silence and inaction point as to why order. it's on the people to bypass a do-nothing council to protect our kids. Thank, Thank you. you. David Burbank. Okay. All right. Council commentary. Prepare a vote. Hold on. Oh, there we go. All right. Prepare to vote. Here we go. All right. Thank you. And Terry, uh, let's do. Uh, resolution 0099. Resolution 2023-99, appointing Carl J. Granrath to fill the position of hearing examiner for the city of Spokane. Okay. We have one person signed up, David Brookbank. Not going to testify. Not going to All right. And just a little preview here. We had um, Councilmember Cathcart, Councilmember Sapone, myself, and we had police officer, we had code enforcement, we had the current, uh, I don't know her title, Kim from the hearing examiner's office, and then our development services person in the interview. We interviewed four people, and um, Mr. Granrath rose to the top. He has experience in land use, and he was an excellent writer. We asked for samples of writings and, and um, somebody Councilmember Bingo Cathcart, what they went to a uh, website and watched him and y yeah, his yeah. his assistant had gone. Um, our current hearing examiner's assistant had gone and on and she went watched and watched hearing. him and stellar. So we put forward his name and happy to do that and uh, council. I would like to testify. Uh, hold on, and uh, our council director. Jacoby already talked to him about that he was chosen and that he would be up for a vote tonight. So that's the background. Now, who said he wanted to talk? David. David, where are you? Okay. I'm David Brookbank. Um, I think that it would be very interesting to develop a different process for choosing panels for selection of uh, people in the city of employees in, in the city of Wash uh, Spokane and also things like the police chief, et cetera. We have a notorious record with that. I mean, you look at the history of police chiefs that we've had, um, and we've had a number of city employees that, you know, fiascos related to things that deal with the social services and housing. Um, I think that the city of Spokane could really use some help in that area. Um, I know nothing about this individual, actually, but um, I, I was looking back at the process of the selection of our last police chief. I actually put together a um, 
uh, paper that I handed out to people at one of the events in the selection of our police chief, and there were 43 people involved, and 22 of them had pro, they were either former police officers currently involved with police supporting organizations or had long histories of involvement with the police on supporting police activities. That's a bizarre collection of people to select a police chief, and we continue to see the kind of problems we've had with policing in our community, and now we have you know, him resigning prior to a uh, mayor coming in who would probably have sat down with him and had a long talk, first of all. But, uh, so I, I would just suggest that there's something that doesn't work with this, and maybe this person is glowing, but all of them are glowing. That's why we hire them, right? They're all glowing. We hire them and then something goes wrong. Some of them are glowing, but it's the internal culture of city government, and Spokane, and police, et cetera, that is part of the problem. So I, I just, and I, in that regard, you could do something uh, in leaving the council, which was to, would be to give back to the people of Spokane who've elected you many times and do some week, weekend, Sunday, uh, Saturdays, maybe six hours, and explain the process of government to folks, including how this council reached that bad decision on the ordinance, for example, on uh, supporting Israel. All of this looks, is very, um, uh, unfortunately, transparent, not very transparent to the average citizen, and um, I think the council owes uh, a different kind of a process where we get more than just blank stares and straight up 7-0 votes on the kind of budget issues we had over the last couple of weeks. So thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Council commentary. Go ahead. Yeah, just brief. Uh, it was a difficult decision. We ended up needing to request writing samples just to make sure that we made the best decision possible. But um, in agreeing with the council president, um, this individual did, did rise to the top, both in terms of the interview as well as the, the writing samples and experience. So happy to support. Anybody else? I would add that all of the finalists were excellent, so it was tough, really. Uh, I think the writing samples did put it over the top for me, so. All right, prepare to vote. Good, thank you. All right, next, Ms. Fister. The next one is resolution number 2023-107, and I'll read its entirety. Thank you. <clears throat> a resolution regarding allocation of funds from infractions yes. issued with automated traffic safety, safety cameras for traffic calming measures, whereas the city recognizes a continued need to enforce speed limits to ensure the safety of drivers, pedestrians, and the preservation of personal property, and whereas in 2010 the council enacted SMC 7.08.148 and thereby established the traffic calming measures fund, the, the TCM fund, in which revenues generated by photo radar and photo red programs author, authorized under SMC 16A.64.220 and 16A.64.260 are directed to the CCM fund and used for the purposes set forth in SMC 7.08.148 and whereas consistent with resolution 2017-106, the council historically has appropriated revenues in the TCM fund to several purposes including A, capital improvements to streets and city infrastructure, with demonstrated success in traffic calming and B, cost to administer and enforce the photo radar and photo red programs, including police per personnel needed to meet state and local requirements for operation of the programs. And whereas on June 10, 2023, the City Council adopted Resolution 2023-0056, approving the use of funds from the TCM fund, traffic calming funds to support targeted speed patrols and acquisition of speed measuring devices, and authorizing the execution of budget grant agreement with the Spokane Police Department regarding use of the traffic calming funds. And whereas on July 10, 2023, the City Council adopted Resolution 2023-57, setting forth an allocation process for traffic calming funds. And whereas on July 31, 2023, the City Council adopted Resolution 2023-63, approving a list of specific neighborhood traffic calming projects and committing to funding of neighborhood projects from 2023 through 2025, and whereas the Spokane Police Department proposes using traffic calming funds to activate a dedicated Spokane Police Traffic Unit starting with four officers, which traffic officers will conduct targeted emphasis patrols in each precinct throughout the city, and whereas the Spokane Police Department projects the additional funds needed from the TCM fund in 2024 beyond unspent previous allocations for targeted emphasis patrol program is $1,800,000, and whereas the City Council wishes to establish clear expectations and parameters for the use of TCM funds beyond the year 2024, and whereas 
after extensive discussions between the administration and the city council regarding future use of traffic calming funds as part of broader discussions regarding the city's 2024 annual budget the city council is amenable to increasing allocations to the general fund to support traffic calming measures implemented by the Spokane Police Department for the years 2024 and thereafter under the terms and conditions set forth in the traffic calming budget agreement attached as exhibit A to this resolution now therefore be it resolved by the city council the council hereby adopts traffic calming budget agreement attached here to as exhibit A and incorporated herein by reference which agreement will govern the allocation use and invoicing of traffic calming funds by the Spokane Police Department for the year 2024 and serve as a guideline for allocations from the traffic calming fund for subsequent years until and unless superseded by subsequent council action and be it further resolved by the city council that subject to execution of the traffic calming budget agreement by the council president and the chief of the Spokane Police Department a portion of the traffic calming funds identified in SMC 7.08.148 in the amount of $1,800,000 shall be reserved for the uses and purposes identified in the traffic calming budget agreement and be it further resolved by the city council that the budget grant agreement approved by the city council in resolution 2023-56 with respect to speed measuring devices and overtime support for the Spokane Police Department shall remain in full force and effect until the specific allocations under that agreement are exhausted and be it further resolved by the city council that nothing in this resolution is intended to affect the allocation process for traffic calming funds set forth mm -hmm. in resolution 2023-57 or intended to affect or disrupt the approved neighborhood traffic calming project set forth in resolution 2023-63. Thank you. We have two people signed up, David Brookbank. Again, again, I'm David Brookbank. I'm with the Party of Socialism and Liberation here in Spokane. Um, I guess what I would say about this is that traffic calming is definitely a need in Spokane. Um, I live in a neighborhood where there is no traffic calming and the speeds with which cars run through neighborhoods is incredible. Um, there, in the part of town I'm in anyways, there are lots of children, new babies, little kids, toddlers, kids playing, wanting to play ball in the streets, et cetera. Nobody seems to understand um, you know, yielding to the person on the right anymore. And so there's just utter chaos um, on the, the roads. Um, I walk a lot and Unfortunately, basically, I just decide where I'm going to cross the street, what's safest for me. Usually, it's safer to cross in the middle of a block than it is to cross at a light. Um, in, in a lot of places, um, you get to make all the decisions rather than counting on the unreliability of the chaos at a, at a corner with um, the kind of rulelessness that you run into. I am concerned about anything that says targeted patrols by the police or targeted activity of any sort by the police. Uh, just in terms of racism in policing and uh, profiling, racial profiling. I got stopped coming back from Pasco late last night by two police officers. Um, actually, there were county sheriffs heading out of Pasco. And it's like, thank you, sir. Your, light, your headlight's out. Um, yeah, you're right. You did. I was worried that I had crossed a, a line that I shouldn't in the process of par uh, parking. And I apologize. I said, don't worry, you're, be on your way. Um, actually told me where there'd be a hotel I could stay in in case I was concerned about the roads freezing. The issue is that, um, you know, there's, they needed to get back to racially profiling their community uh, and not bothering with a person like me. So I'm concerned anytime I hear about the police are going to be targeting, doing targeted patrolling. And I think the Ombudsman's office should, and others who, um, pay attention to police statistics, should pay attention right from the beginning. I know we had a problem with some people being um, uh, stopped in the East Central neighborhood at one point in time several years ago for offenses on bicycles that they were committing, traffic offenses. So um, I guess that's all I would say about this. That um, Yes, I agree with traffic calming, um, police oversight of anything is called for. Thank you. Thank you. Now we have Zach Widmar online. He's going to call in. Yep. Zach, can you hit star three or raise your hand online? Okay, go ahead, Zach. I unmuted you. Hi there. Hey, uh, this is Zach Widmar. Hey, I've got my four-month daughter here on, my, uh, on my shoulder here. So if you um, hear any hiccuping, that's her. 
Um, hey, I just wanted to say something about this traffic calming thing. I don't necessarily support the transfer of traffic calming funds to the police. Um, I think that um, the police will not help me cross Indian Trail Road to get to Yokes. The police will not be able to help me cross Francis to get to Rosars. The police will not be able to help me get down Five Mile Road to get to Rosars or Starbucks. Um, you know, I live within half a mile of a lot of places, um, but unfortunately, I have tried to take my four month daughter in her stroller to any of these places to hang out, and um, I'm really not able to. It's it's really hectic. It does not feel safe. What will feel safe is more dollars into our infrastructure. Um, the traffic calming program was a good first step. It should be um, reiterated upon and improved, not marginalized and uh, stripped for parks. Um, any dollars that are going away from this project seem like a mistake to me for our, what I feel like are underinvested neighborhoods in this city that have been kind of torn down for the sake of uh, uh, traffic throughput over the livability of our residents. Um, I really think that our success as a city going into the future is going to be merited upon how we treat our citizens. If we continue to underinvest in the infrastructure that serves them, I don't think that's good. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, council commentary. Yeah, um, I, don't, I don't necessarily love this, uh, the transfer of dollars, which is kind of what this is from uh, traffic calming, but the, the intent is traffic calming. That is specifically the intent of the, uh, the ultimate spend and to stand up an actual traffic unit, which we have not had for, for a while. So that's the goal. We had some um, capacity in the fund to make this work without affecting any projects currently planned or expected to be uh, going forward. So that won't have any sort of impact there. Um, and with the agreement that this would hopefully be phased out uh, in a short period of time, three years, uh, and get back to uh, you know, focusing traffic calming on actual infrastructure projects, um, I was able to agree to it, and um, we just didn't have a lot of options, but this seemed to make sense. We've got, I think, an agreement in place that will hopefully um, hold folks accountable to how this is intended to be used, and then, of course, our traffic calming committee will have kind of oversight as this moves forward, and, and um, so we'll, we'll make it work best we can. But, you know, we had very few options this year with our, our budget, and um, we'll talk more about that, obviously, next. So leave it there. Yeah, I know a lot of people have a lot of concerns with this, and rightfully so. Um, and thinking through uh, traffic calming and what it's intended to do, when I'm at my neighborhood council meetings, there's not a single thing I hear about more than people speeding through the streets. And so as we're talking about um, you know, this, uh, this um, funding of a traffic unit, uh, to me that seems to be the most prudent uh, traffic calming measure that we can be taking. And so um, I support it for that uh, reason. I believe that... Um, you know, the program will continue to grow as we get uh, many, many new cameras. The amount of dollars in that fund will continue to grow uh, quite a bit, which will again lead to increased capacity for us to be able to do more uh, neighborhood-driven projects, which is gonna be very good. And uh, lastly on this, I think we came to a good agreement on the, on the money and how it would be uh, dispersed to the police department. It is not just giving them $2.8 million, um, it is a reimbursement model, and so we need to see that those dollars are and uh, those units are actually being um, used in the way that we are asking them uh, to be used. And so when they do that, then they can get reimbursements uh, from this fund. And so I think it makes a lot of sense. I think it was a nice compromise, a good win-win for the community. Um, and so I, I think we ended in a good place, and I'm happy to support yeah, I'm really glad that we have this MOU in place or budget agreement. I don't know what we're formally calling it. <laughs> An agreement. <laughs> An agreement um, because I uh, really believe that uh, traffic calming is more than just enforcement. It is a component of it, but the built environment does a lot to prevent things in the first place. And um, as we heard, police officers can't be everywhere all the time but a crossing signal can be there all the time for people to cross safely. And so I have been really opposed to using traffic calming funds to fill budget gaps and holes 
Um, so this policy, I think, will make sure that we have that. I've been supportive of using the traffic calming funds to do a patrol or traffic unit, uh, but I don't really support it beyond that for DUI or other things that events or other things that the police are already doing. Um, so this agreement, I think, is going to be great. And um, I think it creates that assurances that the police will be doing that enforcement. I think there's just been a lot. So I think that's a great compromise, I guess, or agreement. Um, and I think that there's an opportunity in the next quarter at the beginning of the year to uh, adjust funding to uh, fill up back the gap to uh, reviewing some of the uh, SIT plan uh, projects. I, uh, over the weekend, I saw an opportunity on um, some upgrades to City Hall, a half a million dollars there that was kind of a question mark, and I think that could be money that could be used for other things uh, that are more of a priority like traffic calming. While this doesn't decrease any of the projects that are slated for construction over the next two years, it does decrease the opportunity for more projects over the long term. So more projects will not be funded if we are doing this even in the short term. So I will be looking for more funding. Uh, I think we have at least a half a million, if not more, funding that we can dedicate back to traffic calming to build up that environment and create safety because public safety is creating a built-in environment that's safe for everyone, uh, whether you're walking around your neighborhood or in your car or, or just everywhere, making a safer, walkable neighborhood. I will just add real quickly, this, there, a lot of work, a lot of discussion went into this, and um, many of us did not support using these funds. But I think this, it's the best that we can get it right now for the budget situation we're in. But what I want to say is, I want to encourage neighborhood councils, um, community assembly members to keep track, to invite SPD to your neighborhood meetings and your community assembly meetings and get monthly updates. Mm -hmm. I mean, we want those eyes in the neighborhood telling us that there's a presence or that there's a presence if you need to call somebody on a traffic issue. So I would recommend that um, neighbors and neighborhood councils stay um, vigilant mm -hmm. in keeping us posted on if you're seeing a change in traffic in your neighborhood because of some of these patrols. It may not happen quickly, it may be over time, but I really think that um, in order for this to work, it's going to take all of us talking to each other and um, getting that feedback from people living in the neighborhood. So um, I'm going to go ahead and support it hoping that the community will get involved and keep their council members in every district um, updated. Thanks. I just have a couple of words. I support it. I do want to temper expectations. There's only four traffic officers that we are approving, so they can't be everywhere. Hopefully they'll be in your neighborhood, but it will be that partnership between uh, neighborhood councils and the officers who is doing these patrols so please call in call in your areas call in where you're having issues let's give them some data to work off of and we will be looking for reports back on the effectiveness of this going forward but again we're only approving for at this point in time so please it will take time to start seeing the kind of impact we would like to see anybody else Councilman, all right. I just want to remind everybody that this isn't just about speeding. Mm -hmm. It's about distracted driving. It's about road rage. Any other infraction that we see regularly in our neighborhoods, going through stop signs, not stopping for pedestrians, on and on and on. Um, Council President at the time, Beggs and I worked on this four years ago, trying to get police to agree on this and couldn't get there. Glad we're at this spot. Um, there does need to be some accountability, so I won't be here. Y'all need to keep them accountable and say, show us, show us the data, because mm -hmm. that's something you need to know. And I will also say, when it comes to the events, Councilmember Sapone, you mentioned this prior, and we had somebody work for an entire year <coughs> on how to fund events, how to fund safety for events, and that people who... Um, not people, organizations who are sponsoring these events need to be paying their fair share. And it was a good plan. 
it's on a shelf somewhere, needs to be dusted off and implemented because this woman worked long and hard on it. And some of us said, yes, go ahead with it. And it just, it disappeared. Uh, mm -hmm. It went into resolution heaven. I don't know what happened to it, but it's time for you all to figure out where is it and get it implemented because it was a good plan. With that, prepare to vote. Great. Thank you. Ms. Sister, next. Ordinance C-36-467, adopting the annual budget of the City of Spokane for 2024, making appropriations of the various funds of the City of Spokane government for the fiscal year ending December 31, 2024, and providing it shall take effect immediately upon passage. Great, thank you. We have six people signed up, and they're all in person. Scott Ward is first, and then Robert, Richard, and Sam Lee. Hi, um, I spoke on this last week as well, but um, just kind of reiterating, uh, you know, budgets are, are moral documents. Um, they, they reflect our values. Um, you know, I think our, our issues in the city are, are housing affordability. I think our issues are, um, you know, lack of uh, affordable education, higher education. Um, I, I, I think job training programs that are affordable and easy to access. I think affordable health care, things like that are, are, are primary concerns of what really affect working, working class people uh, daily. Uh, so I think, you know, focusing on that rather than further militarizing uh, the police is, is really important. Um, on, Friday, on Black Friday, we had a, uh, a, a rally for Palestine just across the street and um, I mean, it, it's wild, kind of the, the over-militarized police force we experience, like 50 to 100 people, you know, was our, our crowd, completely peaceful, walking on sidewalks, and just, um, I mean, it's, it's very uh, disproportionate, uh, the response, and, and that all has to be paid. So, you know, that, that's, that's a lot of money going to that and overtime pay and all this. Um, I also, uh, two, two Sundays ago at the rally we had, um, I, when I arrived to set up, an officer I'd never met before from 25 yards away called me by my name. Um, I've never been arrested. I've never committed a felony <laughs> or anything like that. So I thought it was kind of wild that uh, I was named like from 25 yards away by someone who I've never talked to and never had a conversation with. So you know, again, like, like where is our, where are, is our priorities? Are, are, we, are we raising, you know, millions of dollars for a, an already over-militarized force? And what are they spending their time on? Like, like are, who, are, how, who are they spying on online and all this stuff? Like, um, so it's just concerning to me. Um, but, but at the end of the day, again, we need a, people that, you know, to afford a, an apartment in the city should not be $1,500. Like, how can working class people, you know, without like a really high paying job afford that? You know, I'm fortunate enough that, you know, what I pay for my home is, is about what most people pay for an apartment in this city. I, I was fortunate enough to, to buy it, you know, at the right time, I guess. But um, people should have affordable housing. People should, um, I think if we could take care of our needs, housing, health care, education, those things first, um, then we're going to have safer communities. You know, we're going to have people that have what they need to, to survive and thrive. And poverty is stressful. And so when people are impoverished, there's that, that's stress. And that affects your health. That affects, you know, everything about your life. And so that's where broken communities, I think, happen from, from the stress of poverty. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, Robert Richard, Sam Lee, and David Brookbank. Robert Richard, I'm a resident of uh, Spokane. Uh, I told Mr. Uh, Forrell I'd... Uh, you can lower that. There's a button on your right-hand side there. Excuse me? There's a button on the right that you can lower the whole... Oh. Yeah. No, wrong way. There you go. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I told Mr. Forrell I'd help read the article by uh, uh, Hewitt uh, uh, Lamb and him. I'd read the first half, I guess, uh, Mr. Justice is online or something, or, I'll, or if he gives me the time to read all, 
call this the article in the spokesman review. A city motto of we all belong doesn't magically make members of our historically marginalized communities feel belong we feel belonging overnight without real actions, resolutions, and public statements against racism, homophobia, transphobia, xenophobia, anti-Semitism, and Islamophobia don't make it feel uh, safer for us. Safety must be felt before belonging can be claimed. We need the commitment from our elected officials reflected in the 2024 City of Spokane Office of Civil Rights, Equity and Inclusion Budget. Our city budget is the ultimate value statement demonstrating the true priorities of our elected officials. So will they show us their motto is more than empty words? Public safety was the hot topic in our local elections. Almost every candidate claimed that they would prioritize public safety if elected disproportionately. Most of them possess very narrow views on what public safety entails. We hope that our current and newly elected officials for the city of Spokane will be open to a broader vision of public safety, and we look forward to having ongoing conversations with them on this topic. Spokane residents from communities like the BIPOC, LGBTQ+, Muslim, Jewish, and immigrant communities don't feel safe simply because of who we are. From the recent ongoing vandalism in Perry District to a local pastor calling for the killings of parents of transgender children, we are reminded of this reality. Many other hate crimes haven't received public attention because Spokane residents don't feel safe reporting them. This highlights the urgency for our elected officials to show a strong stance behind the Office of Civil Rights, Equity, and Inclusion. We need a well-resourced and adequately staffed office to engage in active outreach and build trusted relationships with our communities. With cases of police killings of people by local law enforcement, for example, Marshallese man Peterson Camel, more policing doesn't make us feel safe, he says. We were, uh, if we were the target of a hate crime, we'd have to weigh the risk and likelihood of being harmed by the perpetrator versus the responding officer due to our skin color or our fluency or the lack of in English. Prejudice and discrimination don't have to rise to the level of physical assaults to have deadly consequences. Research studies, including locally conducted ones, have shown that exposure to environmental hazards like deadly Robert, heat waves Robert, is unequally distributed across Robert, neighborhoods. Time's up. Thank you. All right, Sam Lee. In regards, good evening, my name is Sam Lee. In regards to the 2024 proposed budget that gives police $85,182,482, I would like to read parts of Miriam Kaba's essay titled, Yes, We Mean Literally Abolish the Police. The only way to diminish police violence is to reduce contact between the public and the police. There is not a single era in United States history in which the police were not a force of violence against black people. Policing in the South returned runaway slaves. In the North, the first city police departments in the mid 1800s helped quash labor strikes and riots against the rich. Everywhere, police have suppressed marginalized populations to protect the status quo. A demand Miriam Cobb suggests we can all make, and a demand I am making now, is to cut the number of police in half and cut their budget in half. The less police officers there are, the less opportunities they have to brutalize and kill people. Abolish the police, free Palestine. David Brookbank, then Zach McGuckin, and Corey Charles. Uh, David Brookbank again from the Party for Socialism and Liber Liberation. Well, it is a capitalist society, and so government and capitalism basically devotes most of its time, the vast majority of its time, to facilitating capitalism. Capitalism is a system that concentrates wealth in the hands of a few, and it does that in our society very, very, very well to the detriment of needs of people, as we can see in a society that is increasingly unequal and has disturbing 
um, socioeconomic statistics re regarding its, its peoples. One of the issues, of course, is, is policing. I will say that the business community and Spokane government and media, by the way, spend a lot of time um, kissing and licking and washing the feet of Fairchild Air Force Base. It's a, the largest employer in the area. Some members of government are, mem are um, honorary commanders. Some presidents of universities are honorary commanders. Some uh, journalists get incentive flights to go up. For example, Samantha Wolfield covering PFAS PFOA covered a hearing that happened on that out at Medical Lake when the issue first came up and she got taken up on an incentive flight at Fairchild within a few months. You all know what honorary commanders are and what incentive flights are. That's why the silence around Fairchild. So the point is that policing, serving the needs of business at, rather than the needs of people are very common. At this um, event that happened on uh, Friday where we uh, ex exercised our right to protest, there was an incredible um, amount of police. I've been in Spokane and protesting. I've been arrested three times protesting, um, exercising my rights. And there was a beast of a um, Spokane County deputy. Uh, they were patrolling with your police officers on, on Riverside. And he had a bunch of um, shells across his back, flashbangs, chemical weapons, I don't know. So from my website, um, spokanepoliceabuses.wordpress.com from 2007 to 2010. The grants that you folks talked about for the police, that one of them in, in that period, so they alternated in that time. The county would write the grant for both. Um, Spokane City would give their contribution to the report and they'd do, do it the other way the next year. But it had the phrase, in event of riots, civil disturbances, and other law enforcement needs. And, and that had to do with a section related to ammo, military equipment, grenades, batons, muzzle blast, OC, um, chemical weapons, and $10,000 computers. So, you know, the, the, it's not surprising that our police force is as violent as it is. Um, Pavlicek, you probably know the name Pavlicek, he started the SWAT team. He got, came back from Vietnam and became the head of our SWAT team. I think the legacy of Pavlicek and people like your use of force guy, um, Rob Booth, who also um, he's kind of a, a glamour guy for uh, AR-15s. He, he works for companies that modify AR-15s in, in his spare time, as do a lot of Spokane police officers. Thank you. Thanks. Zach McGuckin and Corey Childs. Hello, my name is Zachary McGuckin. I'm a resident of Spokane, and I'm a member of the Party for Socialism and Liberation. Um, one thing I want to discuss about is the amount of funds allocated towards the police. Um, the fact that the police are getting custom fit gas masks. Every member of our police force is getting a custom fit gas mask. Who's, who is gassing the police? No, none of us are. Nobody is. It's to protect the police as they oppress us, as they're violent towards us. You're not giving them the tools to keep themselves safe. You're not, well, you are giving them the tools to do their job because their job <laughs> is to oppress and be violent towards us and to kill working class, poor, black, brown people. That's their job. Uh, so you, in that sense, it is a success um, because it will let them do that more easily. But. Um, if you want to stand on the side of humanity, if you want to stand on the side of the oppressed, on the side of the working class, you will uh, edit this budget um, and severely detract the police budget. And you will call for an audit of our police department. What are they doing with this money? Um, they, they just get rampant amounts of money and we don't see the end results of that. And so audit the police department, decrease their budget. Uh, just this last uh, ordinance, you all are talk were talking about how you didn't like to see the, the funds for this go to other things. You could just take that money from the police budget and I think we'd all be a lot happier. Thank you. Thank you. Corey Childs.
Good, e good evening, City Council. My name is Corey Childs. Um, I think the proposed budget is the complete opposite of what Spokaneites have been asking for. I think that if people were paying attention, we wouldn't have even arrived at this point with the budget. Over just the past couple of weeks, I have seen dozens of people here demand affordable housing, safer roadways, access to essential goods, mental health support, substance abuse treatment, and community centers. This budget shows the complete disregard of all those people. Everyone here should be enraged from, <laughs> from the kind of grouchy veterans who keep voicing their disdain of the pride crosswalk instead of construction of crosswalks in their neighborhoods and repairs for their sidewalks um, to the stay-at-home dad who's continuously fighting for a pedestrian center city. This council is proposing a $12 million, 16.8% increase to the police budget, which is already the largest budget by far. What else is included in this budget though? Fire, public works, streets, and utilities, that's the crosswalks we've been asking for. Parks, libraries, community and economic development, I believe all four of those departments play a part in the community centers we've been asking for. And neighborhood and housing, and neighborhood housing and human services, which is the affordable housing, access to essentials, substance abuse treatment, and mental health supports we've been asking for, from what I understand. Only one of those budgets are even half the proposed police budget. The total increase for every single one of those departments I just mentioned was not even 3.5 million compared to the, that 12 million increase for the police. Public works, streets, and utilities budget is being cut by 1.6% or almost $300,000, so they're not even a part of that 3.5 million. Libraries aren't getting an increase, so they're not included as well. So a 3.5 million increase to only fire, parks, community and economic development, and neighborhood housing and human services, while the police themselves are getting over a 12 million increase. This council is depending on its citizens to not pay attention. If we did pay attention, we'd realize how little you represent us. You are not representing us, city council. We've been here week after week asking you for these things that we need. It's disgusting. Okay, thank you. Council commentary wants to go first. Go ahead. Yeah, I'll be fairly brief. Um, don't love this budget <laughs> at all. Uh, really feel back, somewhat backed into a corner, but at the same time, I also think this is probably the best option that we have given where we are and given the processes that we've, we've gone through to get here. Um, my, my frustration really has been that the process we ultimately adopted to try to just dialogue, negotiate, discuss the various budget issues didn't really come together until September. It should have happened in January. <laughs> this needs to be a full year long budget process because of how complicated our budget is, because of all the myriad of different priorities that folks have, and also um, because of the massive gap that we are dealing with right now that's gonna require a lot of very, very challenging decisions, um, potentially in terms of cuts in the future or additional revenues in the future. Um, and both can be pretty impactful. And so we need a process that allows us to really dig in. Um, but we did start to see a glimmer in my mind, a glimmer of hope as we did see that process settle in. Um, you know, I think we started to see what, what really could be with those discussions at that level. And so that does give me some optimism for, for the next year, uh, as long as kind of the, the lessons aren't, aren't lost uh, that we learned along the way this year. Um, so a couple of things that I just think we need to still consider. Um, we need, I believe, further reforms to our budget process, one that would require long-term sustainability. Um, it's, it's easy to say this budget balances, technically, legally it does, but it's not truly sustainable because when you look at, the, at next year, it's no longer balanced. And so a, to me, a balanced budget needs to balance over two years or longer, not just over the single year. And so we need to make that, I think, a requirement. Right now, that's sort of a, we're encouraging that it does that, but we're not requiring it. I think we need to take that next step. Um, second, I just think we need to be more data-driven in the decisions that we make. Um, there's a lot more information I think we should get when we're making decisions on uh, expenditures, SBOs. Um, and then third, there's actually a tool that we have invested in that we have not yet utilized that I really think we need to bring out for 2024. Um, with Questica, this new software that we bought, there is a public-facing tool where the community can, in real, near real time, I believe, mm -hmm. 
share with us their insights on budget priorities. So they can play with the sliders, they can change the numbers, they can communicate to us what it is they want to see in a format that is really easily digestible. And so for public engagement, I think that would be a fantastic tool to deploy next year. Um, I was told a year ago it was gonna take two years to get us there, so I'm hoping that we can make that happen this year. Uh, also obviously hoping that the budget process will start right away in the new year. Uh, obviously recognizing we're gonna have a new administration and some changes, but that process needs to start um, real early on. Um, so I am reluctantly supporting this tonight, but I do see um, that this is likely the best option that we have. Uh, again, just given the, the short time span in which we've had those negotiations and discussions, but I am optimistic that we can really get this under control into the future. Um, and so I'll be voting yes tonight, um, but again, there's just a lot more that we need to do to fix our budget. Who's next? Go ahead. Go. Um, this was a very difficult budget, but the encouraging part was it's probably one of the most robust discussions as a full council that we've had around decision making on the budget process. We have listened and we have heard what our citizens have wanted and we have tried to deliver within the financial constraints that we are operating under. You know, a lot of things I like to do, but there has to be a mechanism to pay for it. That's the law. I specifically want to speak to the Office of Civil Rights tonight. We have funded that department. This whole entire council supports that department. We have talked to the director. There are two positions online. We're waiting on some data as to as the need grows. We are willing to pivot and add more funding to create those other positions. But currently at this time, that office has not completely stood up. In talking to the director, they will let us know what else they need. So just so the citizens know, we are not turning our back on that department. Also with a public information campaign on how do you report if you've been discriminated against? How does that actually work? So we know there's work to be done there and we are committed to the work and we're committed to funding the work. But we're waiting on that department to get up and stood, let them tell us what they wanna do in partnership with the administration. So I too will be supporting this budget, looking at new opportunities going forward, but this is where we are right now and that's our reality. If I had a magic wand, we would all have what we want, but we don't at this time and this is I think a good compromise on where we can meet in the middle and deliver funding for our citizens and still be fiscally responsible. Yeah, I uh, also agree about the Office of Civil Rights. Uh, to clarify, we are fully funding it at three people and um, there's an opportunity for us to fund the outreach money when it's requested too. So I think that's really important to clarify that that has been a consideration and uh, council's committed to doing that. Um, talked about the traffic calming and process. Yeah, I think it, uh, this will provide a roadmap and I think there'll be updates throughout the year, especially with a new administration and working on uh, the priorities of the new administration and I think uh, we'll be all very ready to continue that work and I'm sure Three council members up here will be very sad to miss it. <laughs> <laughs> Who could that be? Uh, council member Bingo, did you want to say something? Oh. You always want to say something. What do you want? Oh, all right, go ahead. I'm one of those three folks who probably won't miss it, but I have uh, appreciated all that I've learned through this process. And I was reminded just of all the little things that the city provides that we often forget from somebody coming and picking up my trash and recycling every week to roads, even though I know they're a continued struggle. Um, that's something I came in thinking, I'm gonna get to the bottom of why we have potholes. And I did, I sat down with Marlene and she explained to me, but it takes money and it's hard. So I've appreciated all that I've learned through this process. I recognize, really appreciate what uh, Councilman Cathcart called out that this budget, yes, technically balances, but um, uh, I know we have some tough decisions to make in the years to come that we as a community, I'm going back 
to, as a private citizen that I hope that we as a community can encourage and support our elected leaders in being creative in how we address uh, these problems. But I uh, also will be voting in support of this tonight. Who's next? Go ahead. I know. Yeah, I think a lot of good has been said on the budget here, but um, to defend the, the brutes in blue a little bit over here, I will just say that uh, uh, you know our police budget, when you look at Washington State, uh, when it comes to uh, police spending per capita, we're 50th out of 50 uh, in the United States. If you count DC, we're 51st. Um, when you look at the, the things that the community is asking me for, there's not a single thing I hear more often than public safety. And so it should be the largest part of our budget, and frankly, it's not large enough. Um, this council has been very supportive, and I appreciate that, and I appreciate our continued support um, of the police to be able to keep our community safe. And uh, I know that uh, there are many good discussions to be had about police oversight that are 100% valid and necessary to keep people safe. That's 100% accurate. Um, but uh, I, would, I would actually love to call one of them up here and ask them to, uh, uh, to talk to uh, the community here, but uh, it's against their policy for them to be able to come up in, in uniform. Um, but uh, anyway, I think this, this budget was a good step in that direction. I look forward to leading more charges uh, and more conversations to get the police more money um, because we desperately need more officers. We had an increase in call volume of 14% in the last couple of years, and we have not increased um, the number of bodies um, on our police force. And so uh, to our boys in blue, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Um, we're, we're working to get you some more help, and that's the entire council here. So thank you, guys. Councilmember Stratton, you're last. I've been through 10 of these. Has it been 10? Yeah, 10. This was not my favorite. This was a bad one for me. Okay. I hope that next year there will be better working relationships internally to start earlier and include more people and get out there in the neighborhoods together. Um, and I, I will just say that what I've heard the most from people um, is about that public safety. I mean, I have neighborhoods where they can call 911 for um, a crime that's taking mm -hmm. place and nobody shows up. So um, it's difficult making those decisions. I'm gonna support it, but yeah, this wasn't one of my favorites. I'm glad tonight is coming and going soon. As are we, right? Yes. So, okay. Um, let me add, I totally agree with you. We wanted to start earlier, way back when, in January. That's what other cities do. And it gives you, it gives you a bigger picture. It gives you a head start so you're not scrambling at the last minute. The other piece I want to address is public safety because public safety isn't just about police. Public safety is fire. When we have our firefighters telling us that their equipment is 20 and 30 years old, that's a problem. That has to be addressed. So many of our folks live on a wildland border where they are prone to having their houses catch on fire. And we aren't really addressing that. The goats alone can't do the entire job. We have to have firefighters. Uh, parks. Parks is part of public safety in my mind too because it provides programs, things for people to do, especially kids, occupy them so they do stay out of trouble. So public safety is broader than just police. And going forward, those of you who are still going to be here, uh, more of you, and there'll be new people, um, please keep that in mind as you're going forward and try and get that synergy between everybody. You know, we are council members supposedly agreed to have uh, programs for youth that that's now on your shoulders completely to make sure that happens. And, oh yeah, okay, so the two of you. And that's important because um, kids need something to do. And if they don't have something to do, they'll make up their own list of things they want to do. And it's not necessarily what you think should, they should do. So um, be broad-minded about what public safety entails. Start early. Be collaborative with the new administration and involve the public early because that's the one thing that I think we failed to do. So with that, prepare to vote. Good, thank you. First reading ordinances. 
Ordinance C-36-468 relating to the City of Spokane's utility tax amending the Spokane Municipal Code Section 8.10.030A subsection 3, 4, and 7 and setting an effective date. Ordinance C-36-469 changing the zone from context area 4, CA-4 to high density residential 55, RHD 55. For property located at 802 East Sharp Avenue in the City and County of Spokane, State of Washington by amending the official zoning map. Further action is deferred on the first reading ordinances. We have two people signed up. Eric Lowe. So before I begin my comments, I just want to point out that the transfer of funds from the speed cameras was not on the agenda. Uh, I would have spoken on it if it was on the agenda. It's not on the paper agenda. It wasn't on the online agenda. So just wanted to let you guys know that. Um, good evening. My name is Eric Lowe, and I'm a stay-at-home dad residing in Spokane Valley. I'm here to speak in favor of the rezoning of 802 East Sharp. Uh, lots of housing without an accompanying increase in cars is a great thing. I spent a huge chunk of my childhood on the Hamilton Corridor as my grandparents lived in the Chief Gary Park neighborhood, also on Sharp. I'm a big, big fan of the Logan neighborhood. It's where I spent my childhood. My grandfather would take my brothers and I to the donut parade so he could show off his grandkids to all the old coots drinking coffee. Usually after my grandmother took me in for a trim at Shaco's Cuts, then my grandpa would drop us off at Mission Park for a swim. So I would love an explanation from this council as to why you're considering this zoning change while still allowing people to drive highway speeds a mere 200 feet away. The Hamilton off ramp from I-90 flows directly into this neighborhood with no traffic calming measures on Hamilton. I would also like to revise my invitation from a few weeks ago. In addition to walking tours of recent pedestrian fatalities in your districts, I'd encourage each of you to visit Donut Parade or Zeke's Pizza on Hamilton in the next week. Before you enter, just spend a couple minutes standing outside on the sidewalk and consider how uninviting it is to have a restaurant whose sole entrance is three feet from vehicles going 50 miles an hour, spewing all of those exhaust fumes directly into the building. Since 2020, there have been four pedestrian fatalities in the immediate area around Gonzaga. Two on Division, one on Hamilton, one on Mission. Uh, five if you consider uh, Indiana as well. Most Gonzaga students do not drive a car to campus, yet you, the council have placed 100% of the onus on pedestrian safety in a pedestrian district on the pedestrians. Why is that? Do you only care about the people driving through the Logan neighborhood? What will it take to get this council to care about Spokane residents who are not actively driving at this very moment? The residents of these neighborhoods have to deal with dangerous drivers 24 seven. It is not enough to pay consultants hundreds of thousands of dollars of taxpayer funds to conduct duplicative studies you actually have to do the work of calming traffic. Your constituents are begging for action. You are actively ignoring them. The people driving down Hamilton from Meade are not your constituents. Your constituents are the people who live in these Spokane neighborhoods that you have allowed to become drag strips. Giving money to police is not going to stop that. As always, I am here as a resource and a one-man one advocacy organization should you decide to do the jobs you were elected to do. Thank you. Thank you. David Brookbank. Okay, thank you. All right, we are at the end of our agenda. Just a reminder that December 4th is your last meeting for the year, and then you get a much needed rest. And some of us won't be here. Go ahead. Can I just one more time say yes. thank you for your service and as well as Councilmember Ulrich and thank your time you here. Both. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, Council Member Stratton and I are going to start our own business. Um, you're going to do what? Yoga? Teaching yoga? Yeah, I'm going to be a yoga teacher. I'm going to yeah. teach <laughs> hang <laughs> gliding, yeah. And tell jokes. Tell yeah, jokes. But I, I just, yes, I want to reiterate, it was a pleasure to work with all of you. The, we've had our ups and downs, but, you know, honestly, we got a lot of stuff done, and I think we serve the community well. Um, and not everybody will agree with that, but I'm going to stick to that because each and every one of you are valuable. And, me a lot to me, so I appreciate you all. And you will have a much needed rest. Um, things will look very different next year. You'll have three new council members. So that'll be interesting. And you should look forward to that. And you'll have a new council president. And I wish you the very best, Council yes. Member Wilkerson. Remember, 
You know where I live. Come by any time. Okay. Thanks, everyone. We're adjourned. How come I don't know where you live? <laughs>